Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Basur. I'm a consultant doctor and psychiatrist based in private practice in Harley Street in London. And um, this is a Royal College of Psychiatrists podcast. I'm delighted to be joined now by Theodore Porter, who's written a wonderful book, the title of which is Genetics in the Madhouse, The Unknown History of Human Heredity, and it's published by Princeton um, University Press. Uh, Theodore M. Porter is Distinguished Professor of History at the University of California, Los Angeles. His books include Carl Pearson, The Scientific Life in a Statistical Age, Trust in Numbers, The Pursuit of Objectivity in Science and Public Life, and The Rise of Statistical Thinking, 1820 to 1900. He lives in Altadena, California. Um, Professor Porter, I want to start by asking you a bit about big data, because big data is a very trendy uh, subject at the moment. And some of the most valuable companies in the world, like Google and, and, and um, Amazon, attribute their value to the fact they have big data on us. And your, your book is fascinating for many reasons, but one is, in a way, you're kind of saying that history is repeating itself. I think that's what you're saying, that we've been here before, where big data was a fascination, but it led to a lot of trouble. Is it the case that your book is really about the start of, of big data and, it, and its link with psychiatric hospitals back in the, the 19th century? Uh, perhaps I can just say first that when I encountered the word data, in, uh, in uh, some of the things I was reading here, I th was surprised and I checked it out and discovered that it's actually an old word. It's had different meanings, but it was not unfamiliar uh, in the early 19th century when my book begins. So um, uh, the, the first thing is that uh, data is an old concept and not a new one. And uh, uh, the scale of data at uh, Google and uh, and Amazon is uh, far, far, far beyond uh, what uh, these, um, I'm going to call them alienists, since uh, psychiatrist is, the, is kind of the modern term, but it's, they, they uh, were exclusively um, engaged in, uh, in work in insane asylum. Psychiatrists do a lot more than that, and I, I prefer the old word. And these uh, uh, alienists were, uh, uh, were, were relying on uh, the numbers they collected as the main basis for their uh, explanations and their understanding of, uh, of madness and its outcomes. So they're trying to measure your rates. Uh, they're trying to measure uh, or to the counting uh, the different kinds of causes that they registered. So it's, uh, it's not extremely big data. They had a lot of data and there were uh, many, many institutions so if you put it together, uh, you could spend a long time. I spent a long time uh, uh, looking at, uh, at these numbers and a lot more time looking at other kinds of things. So it's kind of big and it, uh, it was in a way data-driven. And people say data-driven uh, now uh, often in a optimistic, uh, you know, favorable way, but the, you know, the, uh, the other side of data-driven is they weren't too sure what, what it meant. They didn't have very good intuitions about it. A lot of these things, and so they uh, they sometimes trusted their numbers even without really being able to explain what was going on. So to sum it up, I wouldn't say that it's a uh, that this is the true beginning of big data, but it is something. Uh, it, uh, it reflects a real uh, uh, faith in data as the way to proceed with a perplexing question of how to treat insanity, uh, what its causes are, uh, you know, whether the institutions were working, things like that. And it seems to me that your book begins with a, a, a moment in history, um, maybe around uh, the second half of the 18th century, where large asylums start to be built. Um, so there's a question about why are so many asylums being built? Why, why is there a sense of a rise in insanity and the need to incarcerate large numbers of people? So something is beginning to happen around this era, which is different and which seems to me from your book puzzles people and even alarms people. What, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit difficult to say exactly when it begins. I would say uh, the early 19th century rather than the late 18th century, but the, there's a, an increase of activity through the late 18th century as well. Um, you know, the, uh, yeah, what's uh, uh, what's really uh, when, what really went on to inspire this uh, this movement is hard to say. Um, in the late 18th century, there are what were usually called 
bad houses. They, their orientation was mostly private. Uh, you had to be uh, uh, you know, wealthy or to have a, a family with means in most cases to be sent there. They were very controversial. Uh, and I, let's say the Bethlehem or Bethlehem Asylum, which uh, we know uh, as Bethlehem, uh, was, uh, it was, was endowed in a way and was public. Uh, but I would say uh, somehow there's a movement in the early 19th century, uh, perhaps it associ- it's, it, it, it's associated with, uh, um, you know, a new kind of, uh, you know, liberal perspective of politics and more faith in human individuals. Anyhow, that uh, insanity can be treated. And there were a number of uh, very optimistic, uh, you know, advocates for uh, for for such treatment. And some of the some of the institutions that grew up uh, in the well around the beginning of the 19th century, I would say in in England, the, the retreat at York would be the obvious thing. A very different kind of institution in Paris, uh, La Salpetriere, and uh, actually some other big Paris hospitals took on what they called moral treatment, which, uh, which, uh, which should respect the patient and to some degree did, uh, which uh, should rely uh, on uh, mostly on actually moral, moral meaning kind of psychological uh, treatments rather than, uh, rather than uh, medical remedies, but also some of the, um, of the physical interventions that seem cruel uh, to us now and maybe then as well. So, so anyhow, uh, there's a considerable increase, I would say, in this, uh, in the number of these institutions, and in the hope that they can cure their patients, uh, taking off uh, around the 1790s or or the 1800s. It could be that the most uh, signal date, however, is not that one, but the 18. Well, actually, France in 1838, uh, uh, England, uh, you know, six years. After that, various German states a little bit later in Scandinavia, in which uh, uh, they moved from institutions, some of which were supported by, by, by charitable gifts, uh, uh, to uh, anyhow to a, to a situation where uh, where states, I, I should say, sometimes uh, in states uh, like England uh, in the United States, it was the states in the American sense. In Germany, it was which was. Uh, 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 was not a single uh, nation until uh, until uh, 1871. It, uh, it it continued to be actually the old the old um, uh, German uh, uh, you know provinces or uh, or uh, rather rather than uh, national states. So the level of intervention is different in various ways, but they all involve a, a commitment to provide uh, some kind of asylum care if necessary for uh, for. Uh, anybody who needed it. It took a while to build the institute. In fact, I say it took a while to build an institutions, institutions to that level. And uh, then when they did have institutions uh, 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 large enough to contain, to hold the, uh, the patients who had arrived by that time, uh, they were uh, much larger again. And so they took a long time to catch up. And uh, instead of, uh, of, uh, uh, of successfully curing uh, all, uh, these uh, patients, a few of them came in and went uh, and were discharged. Here, many came in and stayed there, uh, and the institutions grew and grew um, again from early in the 19th century, especially after the after the promise of institutional care for all, anyone who needed it in the 1840s and 1850s. Until finally, it gets a little bit ahead of my story, but finally, about uh, in the 1950s, these are institutions. I like to say. Like uh, like uh, prisons in the United States now, with uh, something not a full percent of the population, but over a half a percent of the population in many countries. So, uh, and um, you know, it began with great optimism about curing uh, all these people, and moved on to terrible pessimism as the institutions grew. The condition of the patients always looked pretty terrible, and. Uh, uh, and um, and the cost of these things went through the roof and then through the roof again. Um, so so these institutions start um, to be um, put up, and um, there's a sense of anxiety about um, the fact that the large numbers of mentally ill seem seem to be arriving out of the 
population. And um, this seems to drive the collection of data. But could you say something about this anxiety in rates of mental illness? There's a quote in your book that Escourol, famous French psychiatrist, says madness is a disease of civilization. So there was a sense in which they believed that society was progressing, society was, was industrializing, but it seemed to be creating madness in some sense. Uh, that was certainly one uh, one uh, argument which uh, had some credibility. Uh, I don't. There was never really an agreement on what the what the reason was, and I would say uh, the the you know, alienists, the psychiatrists, also actually came to think that uh, that uh, much of the of the increase was a result of changes in the. I mean, uh, the availability of the institutions, changes in the conditions within which people lived, and the the, the sorts of opportunities and uh, or expectations that applied to people who were, let's say, on the edge of insanity or madness, and we have to recognize that um, uh, that whether or not you are going to be diagnosed insane is dependent on a lot of uh, factors, you know, involving your family situation and your work situation, and whether you're urban or rural, uh, as well as uh, you know, uh, let's say you're. Uh, the objective conditions of your of your mind, and uh, I would say, though, on on one side, the alienists really wanted to believe that that, that uh, insanity was a disease like any other disease and could be diagnosed reliably. At the same time, uh, it, there's quite a wide recognition that when you build an institution, people in the neighborhood, a lot of people in the neighborhood who were not known to be insane, are going to appear at the institution as insane. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, it's um, it, it, it's it, you know, the disease was uh, had a had a, had an ambiguity in many cases, even if there are plenty of cases where there's no ambiguity at all, and where the you know the suffering and mental disorder is uh, is is manifest and, and even kind of terrifying. So these institutions were controversial, and there was a controversy about whether they got anyone better. But various forces come together to lead to data collection. So they start collecting a lot of data. On, on their patients. And this is a journey that's the, at the beginning of your book that leads um, to eugenics and maybe the rise of fascism and so on. But let's go back to the beginning of this journey, which is this collection of this data. And another person that you've written on and, and done extensive research on, Carl Pearson, a very famous statistician who found a, an important journal in statistics. So this is right back at the beginning of the whole science of statistics. This journal is called Biometrica. And you say in your book that in fact, some of the early papers were, were about data collected in these institutions. So they, they become kind of data collecting machines. Uh, that's right. Uh, uh, I asked myself, you know, when I first encountered uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, tables that filled the reports of the Journal of the institutions. Uh, what was the reason for that? And I would say there is some. I mean, the, the institutions become quite large, and there were reasons for them to gather data uh, to keep track of the patients there. But uh, the main thing is that they were receiving public support. They were they were from the beginning somewhat regulated by central governments, and uh, more and more so uh, as the 19th century and 20th century centuries, uh, 19th and 20th centuries progressed. Uh, so the, uh, the data was, uh, I would say, first of all, was a gesture of accountability, of re political responsibility. And um, they, I would, the most important number they corrected was probably about the outcomes, and especially whether they were curing patients. Um, uh, the uh, other most interesting number, and the one that I focus on, was uh, was statistics of causes. Now that's another interesting question: why almost all of these reports include tables of causes? And I think it probably reflects simply the conventions of medical reporting that preceded the expansion of asylums. That is, the cause was something you wrote down uh, when in a medical report. In any case, the the massive admission books that uh, you find that all of these institutions with all their lines for writing down, you know, information on each patient almost always had an entry for cause and maybe maybe after a while uh, an entrance also for heredity, it was kind of heredity question mark. Uh, so um, in some way we have a, 
uh, an activity that that reflects you know institutional requirements or state requirements, which uh, was always a little bit interesting and comes to seem more and more interesting. That is this question of cause and the possibility of hereditary cause as the institutions increasingly look like failures from the standpoint of what they had promised to do, which was to cure the patients. And some even thought there are a few that some even suggested, you know, not to build too large an institution now because pretty soon everybody will be cured and we'll have to do something else with it. But what really happened was they built uh, institutions and then bigger ones and they immediately filled up and, uh, and there was pressure to to build yet another. So, uh, and um, anyhow, that that experience led to a, a, a terrible preoccupation with the reasons for the failure and what we can, what the institutions can do if they're not going to cure the patients. Well, they were public institutions all along. They saw themselves uh, as engaged in public uh, in, in public health work, and uh, the public health work um, uh, entailed. Uh, 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 trying to prevent uh, the, this uh, condition as well as to cure it. And the cure is not working very well. They preached to the populations around them to you know, watch to, to watch your behaviors, don't drink too much. Masturbation was often, I mean, actually masturbation appears in all these tables as an important cause. I think they gave up on curing or on blocking uh, insanity by uh, preventing masturbation, but they certainly th thought that uh, heredity was something that could be dealt with. So we say heredity is destiny, and in some ways maybe it is, but heredity was a thing which they felt they could act on. And so they became more and more interested in trying to prevent the kind of marriages that they thought would lead to the reproduction of, of this illness. And so that's what, that's what I discuss as the gradual uh, increase of interest in in something like eugenics, uh, though the word wasn't being used that, but in trying to uh, control the expansion, the growth of insanity uh, by uh, by by uh, changing the by preventing those the insane from reproducing themselves, and with it reproducing their condition, and and encouraging people to make wise marital choices, meaning to marry uh, in, into families that were healthy. I want to get to the eugenic story in a moment, and it is a very important part of your book, but I want to just stay with the data collection bit and the fact that we seem to see very interestingly and perhaps ironically what we see today, which is some, some dodginess around some of the collection of the data if it, if it doesn't suit certain purposes. So there were issues around the quality of the data and the fact that sometimes it wasn't very good quality and been recorded very well. And you, you relate a wonderful incident in the book where the Yorkshire Asylum burns down rather conveniently around the time its books are meant to be inspected and there seems to be problems with it with its 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 record keeping and very conveniently all the records go up in flames um that was the, I mean, that happens very early in my story uh, and uh, uh, you know destroying records was clearly clearly seen as, uh, as as improper and even immoral all along but the uh, the terms under, I mean, the conditions under which data were gathered were that these are very interesting for me and not that easy to figure out because uh, almost nobody talks about uh, people talk people write down what what their data is, but almost nobody talks about the conditions under which they recorded this uh, these data. Well, the doctors, um, okay, so let's just take 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 a, a, a piece of information like the cause. Um, what would that be? Well, even if even if the doctors, you know, understood causes of insanity, which they thought they knew something, uh, they weren't there in the household when the there when somebody's uncle or you know or uh, wife or child began acting strangely. Um, so uh, uh, there was, uh, you know, perhaps this this is something that happens outside the institution. Once they come inside the institution, they're being Watched, and it would be very optimistic to suppose that the alias could identify, you know, true causes of insanity, even under those conditions. But uh, I wanted to know, uh, you know, how the, I mean, uh, under what conditions did did uh, 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 heredity emerge as such a, as an important cause? And what were the were the doctors already assuming that they don't seem just to have written down what they wanted to 
write down. And uh, different institutions had, I'm sorry, on the other hand, different institutions had numbers that were different enough that you have to believe that the doctors were somehow shaping the answer to that question. Or in, I know in some cases they refused to recognize, I don't think any of them refused to recognize uh, in heredity as a cause, but they refused to recognize it as the kind of cause that should be entered as a cause in, in, in the book. So in some cases it wasn't present at all, but in many cases it was regarded as quite common. And again, I say it wasn't that easy for me to determine you know, whose conviction exact, exactly this was that the cause of, the, of this particular case of, uh, of madness was heredity. Um, I, my sense in the end was that the doctors and the patients kind of agreed, or, 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 or the, re, the lay reporters kind of agreed on the importance of heredity, and that the lay reporters looked around, and if they saw a relative who had something that looked similar, they were likely to, re, to report, uh, report heredity as a cause. So, um, so on the one hand, uh, the data keeping was, was, uh, became a very routine part of, uh, of work and something which at least some wanted to take very seriously. Um, I mean, for, let's say, scientific medical reasons, as well as for budgetary bureaucratic state reasons. Uh, and then what exactly should count as evidence for the various things they wrote down was still somewhat in play. But so during um, the 19th century, they become increasingly, um, it seems, preoccupied with a major, um, if not the major cause of mental illness. And this arises out of this data that they're collecting. So what happens next in, in this story in terms of after they, they arrive at the conclusion that, that um, hereditary is extremely important? Uh, well, one thing, uh, I mean, the book is actually uh, even more about uh, the history of human, let's say, let's say genetics. That's a word that doesn't appear until the early 20th century either. But whatever the causes, the, 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 um, the factors of, hu of human inheritance. And um, I was a little surprised. I mean, we, I enter, entered into this with quite a lot of doubts about how seriously this kind of, uh, this kind of research uh, could have been in. 1850 or 1870, and found that at least there were all there was a string of people who took the who took the questions quite seriously and did their best. I mean, besides doing their best to get good data, tried to improve the quality of uh, of knowledge they had. Uh, so, one one factor there is to try to keep. I mean, let's say sorry, let's, um, uh, the institution itself, the patient, the patients are there. They're a captive audience. Uh, the doctors are watching them, so it's easy to write down stuff about them. And you can also uh, there. There was at least a moment uh, of admission when, in many cases, a family member came in with the patient and could be asked questions, and perhaps the patients themselves would be responsible enough and coherent enough to answer questions about these things as well. Um, um, but uh, you didn't know anything about what, what you do about the family. Well, the, somebody might tell you that. And they developed from the 1840s and 1850s already. They were developing strategies for finding out about the family, not just what somebody told them, but going out into the countryside and trying to see these people. Um, so, uh, or um, um, for a long time, they relied on a measure which they called percent hereditary. And that was roughly. Any, if, if a relative could be found of a patient in the asylum, the case would be called hereditary. Uh, and there's even, I mean, people can be quite guileless on these things. And I found one doctor, uh, you know, around 1900, imagining that with further research as they got to ever, ever, uh, an ever wider uh, range of, uh, an ever larger number of, of relatives, that they would be able to prove that in fact all cases are, uh, are, uh, are hereditary. But, uh, uh, well, actually, again, well, there's a, uh, a, um, a a researcher along these lines who, uh, you know, faced with with that possibility, uh, compared uh, the number of uh, of uh, of patients in the asylum who had uh, identified uh, um, insane or, or or mentally ill relatives with uh, 
number of people who were mentally themselves mentally healthy who had relatives like that, and the number wasn't all that different. So obviously, if you uh, extend uh, you know the, your investigation on a family to the seventh cousins, then we all have insane relatives, and we could all, any of us who uh, who had mental illness could be identified as a hereditary. Uh, so in fact, all these questions are were um, you know about what I mean, first of all about um, uh, I say uh, all these efforts, all these uh, about which uh, relatives are relevant for this question, and you know what is the what do we know about the likelihood that the offspring of somebody who's been in, in an asylum will be insane? What do we know about that from that fact alone? What other kind of data would we need to know? Uh, I found that the um, that there are at least it's possible it's there are people um, from the mid 19th century on who took the, 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 the these in inquiries pretty seriously uh, and who um, you know developed uh, techniques for trying to estimate for instance the probability that a person with a certain background would become insane so you do have the beginnings of something like a science a data-based science of human heredity appearing uh, in uh, you know in, in these institutions. Um, okay. The other, just uh, the other. I think you're at the other thing that um, that I, I think was what your question was looking for is that when um, you know genetics appears a nice, a convenient date for the beginning of genetics is 1900 when Gregor Mendel's you know experiments on plant hybridization, which were mostly were not were not seen as very interesting for a long time, suddenly appear on the scene and be, and become the basis for a, for an acceleration of interest in, in, a, in a science, which a few years later is uh, William Bateson in England calls uh, genetics. And, um, uh, and uh, the other side of this, the, uh, the more purely statistical side involving um, the uh, um, uh, mathematician um, Carl Pearson uh, working in London, um, also is really getting going at about the same time. And it turns out that uh, there, I mean, to the extent they were interested in human heredity, uh, that uh, uh, they, uh, uh, that almost all of the, and, uh, and the first generation of eugenicists, that almost all of them uh, got their, uh, got their were, were getting their data from, well, insane asylums, by this time also schools for what were usually called feeble-minded children. So. Um, another kind of mental disability. Um, you know, distinct the insane asylums are people who ended up in these institutions. The insane are people who ended up in these institutions. The feeble-minded are usually kids who, um, in the late 19th century, when kids were supposed to at least get an elementary education, didn't do well and were held back or couldn't really stay in school. They become feeble-minded. Pretty soon they're talking about a crisis of the feeble-minded and uh, anyhow, they also, those institutions for the feeble-minded also kept data like this, including on heredity. And so these, and these two uh, sources of heredity, become, these two sources of data on heredity become the main basis for the, the work of people who really look like, uh, look like scientists and mathematicians in the early 20th century. They start out, uh, you know, tr trying to find data and they discover not only do the institutions they look to have a lot of data, but they have also people who knew quite a lot about what to do with the data. So, uh, uh, so the, I mean, my argument is that, in, that it really makes sense to see this, uh, the formation of a, whatever genetics, or at least the science of human heredity as, as occurring gradually and involving a lead role for these, uh, for these doctors and psychologists who, uh, who were, um, you know, keeping track of of uh, you know people judged to be insane and uh, people judged to be mentally weak or feeble-minded. But there also seems to be a transition away from collecting just data from particular institutions to national databases. There, there's a shift, and I think um, from your book, uh, maybe perhaps particularly in Germany, where millions of people's data begins to be collected. So it's a statewide enterprise. It shifts from a institution-wide to a statewide enterprise. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that's a you know a complicated uh, issue. On the one hand, actually, there are censuses of insanity going. I think you know in, there are simple censuses of insanity, seemingly as early as eighteen hundred. 
Uh, there's a pretty good one in Norway, which somehow has a quite a quite a prominent role in this story at several points in 1825 to 28. There are so uh, um, and uh, there are, there are uh, repeated uh, uh, censuses of different kinds all through the 19th century. They were both interested in shall we say, the scientific question of what the real level of insanity is in a population, because everybody seems to recognize the doctors, the mathematicians, everyone, that um, just counting the people who land in an insane asylum doesn't give you a proper measure of the whole population. There may be lots, there may, may be lots of invisible insanity. And again, that it kept, when they thought they had room for all the patients, and then that proved to be you know, over and over, it proved that they didn't have enough, that the numbers kept growing. They suspected that there are more insane people out there, and that the only way to find out how many is to census them. In fact, censusing them didn't solve the problem either, because the number that they found was always less than were in the institutions 10 or 15 years later. So those all the numbers keep keep increasing. So, I mean, it's not it's not really quite right to say that first you have the the, the the counts in the institutions, and then you have the counts in the uh, of uh, census counts of the whole population. Uh, you have both of these going on at the same time, and I would characterize the big move, which is so pronounced in Germany, but which happens in varying degrees all over, is is to try to put the different kinds of data together. So uh, the, the Germans call this a um, a, a central stelle, the central repository. Of information, and this is a this is a you know for us in the, you know in the, the late twentieth or early twenty first century, this is one of the great uh, fears: is that uh, you know that if I go to the doctor, then pretty soon my employer knows, uh, or the you know if I something that happens to me in the army, and now um, maybe they're going to pass it along to uh, you know to my friends, or uh, you know, but uh, but this is a positive ideal. Uh, with a modest sense that this is information that sh that you know this has should be protected to some degree, to bring together you know the data from militaries and churches and insurance offices and schools and prisons and uh, uh, you know insane asylums and on and on and to have them all together so that we really have a picture of the whole population and the interrelation of all these different kinds of conditions that uh, you know that a state. Uh, should be interested in, and that is that you know that is, that is a great move of the, you know of the late nineteenth century and into the twentieth century, and the availability of data like that uh, is associated with some of the terrible stuff that happens uh, in the in, in the early twentieth century. Let's talk about the terrible stuff that happens then. Tell us a bit about that. Well, um, I mean, this is not directly connected, but. Uh, it's not as if when the Holocaust starts up that er, who, everybody who's Jewish is well known, but in fact, there are all kinds of record of registers of things like that, um, uh, which were uh, uh, not didn't didn't uh, uh, provide everything that the um, Holocaust wanted, but provided a starting point from which to investigate these things. And um, okay, I mean that's that's the most. Uh, you know, terrible story, and its relationship to this is not 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 tight, but but real. Um, uh, yeah, okay, but the, uh, yeah. But the, the collection of data and the development of interest in hereditary causes leads to eugenics, uh, the idea that we should um, be careful about where our genes end up. And so doesn't that lead, isn't there a link between the rise of Nazism and this interest in eugenics, going back to this interest in hereditary being a very important part of the causation of mental illness? Uh, you know, the, I found the first, uh, um, you know, per, per talk about uh, about inter interfering, of that a state, and by the way, I don't think inter inter eugenics is only state intervention, but state intervention, you know, involves a particularly you know, a, a terrifying uh, form of this. And uh, actually, the uh, I found uh, uh, Scottish uh, poor law officials in the uh, 1850s already saying, well, we're going to keep, uh, you know, these um, 
um, single women, uh, um, whatever, from reproducing their condition, then maybe we should keep them in the institution. So there's a kind of eugenics actually already associated with putting people in an institution. It probably keeps them from reproducing for as long as they're there, uh, at least it, it, it was supposed to. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so uh, I, I would make a somewhat more specific claim about the origin of eugenics, that it was really, you know, uh, anchored in the, uh, first of all, it, 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 it begins to appear, not under that name, in the institutions as an ideal of the institutions to both to keep people from reproducing while they are there, and second, to provide the evidence of the institution to, to, to persuade other people uh, who, uh, uh, not to refrain from marriage if they are themselves from a bad family, and to uh, take care not to marry into other bad families. Um, and that, that uh, well, you know, um, that is the main, uh, the increase, as people thought, of feeble mindedness and insanity was the. Uh, main incentive and the institutions that uh, that dealt with these people were really the main sites of at least negative eugenics that is of the attempt to keep people who were regarded as undesirable from breeding um you know it wasn't strictly limited to that but i think you know for uh, most of the era when eugenics was you know under that name very much on the agenda that is from let's say uh, a little after 1900 into the 1930s. Um, it was a wide ranging ambition. There were some people wanted to emphasize having uh, those with good qualities to, to reproduce more, as well as those with what were seemed to be bad qualities to refrain from reproducing. There was always more interest in the bad qualities and in stopping the reproduction of those than there was in the, in the, in, in the hopes of, uh, you know, of building a super, or a, you know, a wonderful uh, race of uh, of intelligent uh, athletes and scholars and political leaders and whatever. So there was always the fears that uh, that moved people most, and it was the it was the prisons and the schools for the feeble minded and the insane asylums that were at the center of this uh, of this commitment. Now, what happens after the Second World War? Because one would have thought that with the Holocaust and the, the downfall of Nazism, that eugenics and a preoccupation with, with hereditary uh, uh, linked to psychology and psychiatry would have been discredited. But your book says that actually the story is a bit more complicated than that. Yeah, that's, you know, the historical research of the last few decades has shown that, um, that, the, that, that the, the sense of the Holocaust or that, some, that, the, that the eugenics, that the, that the Holocaust was, uh, you know, associated with Eugenics, and that the, actually the let's say not just the Holo the Holocaust of Jews and Gypsies and such people, but um, actually the first Holocaust in a way uh, was the uh, was the murder of uh, of some hundreds of thousands of people in insane asylums in Germany. Um, but um, but that is that uh, you know. Uh, that was it wasn't at first uh, you know, evident uh, uh, on the one hand um uh, there was uh, increasing opposition to uh, to eugenics at least of, of forced sterilizations growing up before uh, the uh, the nazi holocaust and it wasn't that clear to people uh, i mean i should say i don't, I don't want to presume that it is actually the case but it, it not many people were, were not Many people were not convinced. The general way we talk about these things did not reflect a belief that the Nazis had discredited eugenics. Um, the annals of eugenics continued to be the annals of eugenics into the 1960s, um, and then I mean, eugenics was it was becoming a a word for something bad in in that time. And by the 60s, and by, by the 60s, that was pretty well settled. It wasn't settled at first. So that's one dimension of this: is that the uh, uh, the you know the uh, the ambition to improve the population or to prevent its degradation with some kind of um, guidance of reproductive decisions um, you know as a systematic program that didn't go away at first and it wasn't obvious to everybody maybe it shouldn't be obvious that the Nazis that that was really what the Nazis were about um, 
Um, uh, the other thing is, however, that uh, though nobody wants to be, or almost nobody wants to wants to be accused of being uh, uh, of being a eugenicist now of uh, engaging in eugenics, actually the attempt to guide reproductive decisions and to guide and to use uh, uh, genetic techniques to affect the characters of the population goes on. Uh, and um, um, so, and uh, also actually the, uh, the attempt to keep people uh, from reproducing who seem not suited to it. Now, a, a lot of those, uh, of those uh, um, interventions, which, some, which were continued to be forced interventions uh, into the 50s and even into the 19. 60s, a lot of those were no longer explicitly uh, you know, justified as eugenics. It might be justified in terms of poverty and poor education and you know, unsuitability to raise a child and so on, but, it, but the effects are pretty close to eugenics. And for a long time, the law that allowed sterilization against the will of a person was eugenic law. So uh, even after people became sheepish about the word eugenics, eugenics went on. And, um, uh, you know, it's not gone now either. And uh, some of the enthusiasm about new, um, uh, you know, uh, genomic knowledge and genetic techniques and, you know, reproductive technology, some of that enthusiasm is about the possibility of producing what we will just go ahead and call, you know, better babies or better, more fit individuals. So, you know, um, nobody thinks that helping people to produce uh, babies whom they think will be more athletic or have good eyesight or whatever. Nobody thinks that that's to be compared with uh, murdering hundreds of thousands of, uh, of uh, people who were committed to public institutions. But uh, the eugenic vision is not gone. It, is, it, is, uh, it has been with us throughout. We saw, you know, it appeared, um, uh, it, it appeared with little provocation, you know, two centuries ago. As soon as, you know, the studies of, when there are studies of human heredity, they were interested in the quality of the population, and we are interested in the quality of populations. Now, we don't call it eugenics, or we stop calling it eugenics again, but it's really, it is eugenics, and uh, it, it goes on. What do you think we have to learn from this very important history that you've written um, today? Because I started off by talking to you or asking you about big data, because we live in a world of big data, and for example, people who work at Google write books um, because they have access to big data where they claim to kind of know what's going on inside our heads. They, they claim to know because of our searches for taboo subjects, what's really going on. So there's a, a sense of, we, we live in a world where big data has big power um, again today, just like maybe it did have historically. I mean, what, what are your thoughts of the lessons that people need to, to learn from your history? Well, I mean, it, it speaks both to the power of power and to the limits of data. Uh, uh, data uh, works only when it's uh, structured in, I mean, not just one way, but in certain ways. And sometimes it, you can get numbers like that, and sometimes you can't. Uh, the data often, uh, we often uh, have data on the things uh, of secondary importance and try to find our way to things of more urgent importance. So, I mean, the we have to, I mean, you know, this is pretty uh, a pretty homely comment, but uh, um, data is both extremely powerful and has definite limits and often structures our inquiries in ways that we're, aren't what how we would structure them if we could get, you know, all the sort of data that we really would like to have. Uh, so, um, it, it again, it it's, it's not a very clear, uh, you know, conclusion. It speaks both to the power and the limits. Of data, uh, I'm more inclined to conclude with uh, you know, with with thoughts about the uh, the reasons for the study of in, of inter, uh, of uh, genetics and, and and genomics, and to recognize that in our own time um, uh, that we should understand the hopes of genomic intervention as a kind of as a kind of genetic, a kind of eugenics, as a, as a hereditary intervention. Um, that doesn't mean that we should simply condemn it, and probably we're not going to bring back the word eugenics, which is now tainted with, uh, you know, with uh, all, all these years of 
uh, you know, of, of sterilizations and, you know, um, you know, and, uh, and other interventions, but we are engaged in, um, in uh, reproductive interventions and we need to think about what's appropriate and what, what isn't. It's both promising in some ways and um, I think, well, I think dangerous. I'm not the person to, uh, to give lessons in genetics, but I think that anything, if we have stable populations and if there were easy ways to, if there are easy ways to make us into wonderful, you know, super intelligent, super athletic uh, people, it would have happened. Uh, and uh, mostly we, I think, live, mostly uh, our situation now is that, uh, you know, that if we um, take up uh, working hard to breed certain kinds of traits, there are going to be losses at the other end. The, um, you know, race horses are something run very fast, but they have a lot of disadvantages and we don't want to perhaps turn ourselves into the race horses of, uh, of humanity who are extremely good at whatever from athleticism to mathematics to whatever to medicine if um if uh, you know it, 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 the, the, there's a um, cost to these also, things as well but i also thought one of the interesting things that came through is how data can have a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy element to it um i thought i read in your book or, or got a sense of that the people collecting the data in the insane asylums in the 19th century had already kind of like decided that they thought her about hereditary. And as a result, they put down hereditary quite a lot as a cause. And therefore the data suggested that hereditary was a key factor in mental illness. So it became a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy or cycle. And I think that that's quite an important message that data, we, we have to examine how the data is collected, why it's collected, as you put it, the conditions on the because Otherwise, it can be collected in a certain biased way, which drives a certain agenda. Uh, I think that's certainly the case. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the data that, uh, that these 19th century uh, uh, alienists were collecting was compromised both because uh, much of what the, uh, both because, because the patients weren't really, really in a very good position to assess what these causes would be. Actually, the doctors weren't in a very good position assess that either but they were developing a discourse which uh, which made that a meaningful question and uh and then um in fact however it, sometimes it really looks like they're just uh just blindly collecting the data and believing the uh believe and, and accepting the outcomes but that doesn't actually the, the the knowledge that that produced was uh, was not very convincing i mean to looking looking back uh, and uh uh, and if instead they are uh, um, have an idea already of what the right kind of, of data is, then you know, it might again be valuable. But uh, but you have to check it against the expectations and and uh, and assumptions about what you know what what causes were possible and what causes would be interesting that uh, that the doctors used to filter all this information that came through. So I mean I you know I take a <laughs> I take a uh, you know a, an in between sort of position on data, which is quite wonderful, um, um, but uh, but uh, but but already uh, you know imposes it directs us to certain kinds of things what we what we can study with or what uh, on what we can gather a lot of data and directs us away from other kinds of things which might be the most important and we have to you know to to find a a, a way of integrating. Uh, you know, the data we can get with the critical reasoning and the uh, expectations that we have uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in studying with data. Professor uh, Theodore Porter, many thanks indeed for talking to us. Uh, Professor Theodore Porter has been talking about his new book, the title of which is Genetics in the Madhouse, The Unknown History of Human Hereditary, published by Princeton uh, Books, Princeton University Press. Uh, Professor Theodore Porter, thank you very much indeed. And thank you.